So events like this are great. Uh, I'm very happy about all the connections and friends and people that I get to meet in places like this. It was in a similar uh, event like this back in Brazil where I met our next speaker, principal, principal cloud developer advocate at Microsoft. So I've known him for many years, more than a decade, I would say. Uh, and I think of the many places that you can run uh, Spring technologies, Microsoft Azure is certainly one of them. So please uh, welcome Bruno Borges to the stage. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Well, friends. Anybody from Brazil? Yay. OK. <laughs> we'll try next time. <laughs> um, I'm Bruno Borges. I'm at Microsoft. And it's a pleasure to be here at Spring One talking to all of you about what Microsoft has been doing for the Java community, for Spring, for Spring developers working with Pivotal and Pivotal Cloud Foundry and so many other things. Before I talk about those things, I just want to walk you through some of the past things. Um, you might be as surprised as I am, not just because of me 10 years ago, looking very young without a wife and a kid and a dog. Um, at that time, this was at ApacheCon 2008. I was just an individual developer, not working for any major uh, vendor company. And uh, it was extremely exciting for me to be at that conference to learn about open source, learn about the Apache way, and to meet so many people at Apache Foundation. Interestingly enough, when I joined the company, I met Ross Gardler, the executive vice president of Apache Foundation, who has been at Microsoft for five years. And I said, hey, Ross, I met you 10 years ago. What happened? You are at Microsoft. I am at Microsoft. And he said, well, people would have laughed if he said that we would be at Microsoft 10 years ago. And that, to me, is interesting, because I do, I do like a lot the things that I've been seeing at Microsoft, this, the things that I've been seeing. And I'm sure you all uh, feel the same way. Um, let's just take a look at 1995, who here was born by that time. In 1995, a couple of things happened. Johnny Mnemonic was released. It was one of the worst movies at that time. It was the worst plot of a movie. He had this pen drive in his head for 80 gigabytes, and the movie was plot for 2021. So 20, uh, 80 gigabytes in his head, OK, maybe that's a lot, but not for 21. So um, um, at that same year, Another movie uh, was actually great. It was Braveheart. You know, everybody wanted freedom. This guy clearly delivered that, although he died. Anyways, at that year, eBay was released. Do you, do you know that? Did you know that? eBay was released first time. It went online in 1995. You know what else happened in 1995? Yeah, Windows 95. By that time, there was no CD-ROMs. You actually had to install using a floppy disk. You guys know what a floppy disk is, right? I hope so. It was very painful to install Windows at that time. You have to keep switching the disks. My dad told me, hey, Bruno, you want to work on computer? Yeah, here, change those disks. <laughs> and I was like, can we just call Johnny to install this thing for us? You know, just plug on his hand and boom. Uh, so 1995 was an interesting year for the internet, right? The boom of the internet started over there, especially thanks to, uh, e I, I guess, eBay. Um, but then something else happened. It was when Java was released. It was 1995, thanks to some microsystems. So 1995 was an important year for Microsoft, for some microsystems, and for us, for all of us. Now. After 1995, there are things that I will not cover, so I'll just put in this black hole of history. And if you want to know about that, that's up to you. I'll just jump over to 2012. That is when Microsoft said, you know, we need to get this open source thing. So Microsoft spin off this subsidiary called Microsoft Open Tech, Open Technologies, just to learn about open source, do open source, and so on. A couple other things happened in 2012. Microsoft acquired a company called Yammer. If you've been in the Java industry for long, you might know this framework called Drop Wizard. Yammer actually created the framework, and it's still there. And Yammer continues to use at Microsoft, continues to work 
on Drop Wizard. So that's actually pretty interesting. In 2014, Microsoft acquired the most expensive, I mean, the most successful Java desktop application by that time, Minecraft. And Microsoft continues to work on the Java edition because the community of Minecraft is so big, so many mods, so many kids learning how to code Java and customizing Minecraft that just, you know, you cannot just say, you know, Java edition uh, should go away. It's impossible. The community is huge, just the same way as the Java community is huge and will never go away. In 2014, you know, Satya Nadella was already in the company, and we really wanted to say, hey, you know, Linux is big. And by that time, Microsoft Cloud was called Microsoft Windows Azure. And having Linux VMs on Windows Azure, what is a, it was a little bit of weird. So Microsoft created this uh, uh, VM depot as part of Microsoft OpenTAC to publish VMs or images of Linux uh, systems. So you could run that. Uh, on Windows Azure from that third-party marketplace. Then, 2016, Microsoft said, you know, let's put SQL Server on Linux. If, you, if, you, if this is news to you, that's OK. The other thing that happened at that time is the JDBC driver for SQL Server was actually made open source on GitHub. So it's not only available in Maven Central, but you can actually see the source code on Git, on, on GitHub, and even contribute to it and work as a true open source project. That is 2016. And then finally, uh, lots of open source foundations. We are a member of the Eclipse Foundation, the Apache Foundation, the Linux Foundation. We are also working with the Cloud, uh, cloud Computing um, Native Foundation and many other um, groups and organizations that invest a lot on open source. So Microsoft changed a lot by that time. And of course, this year, this happened. The biggest open source community, Microsoft, said, you know, let's work together. And actually, lots of things have been happening the past few months after the acquisition. And we are actually delivering some interesting things uh, for GitHub, Microsoft Azure users to play with cloud and open source projects. And I'll show you a little bit about that. So a lot has changed since then. Not just for Microsoft, but also for me. As I said, I became a parent. So you have to take care of those things, you know, babies. And it's, it's, it really takes an effort. And we really want to take that effort with the Java community as well. So where are we with Java at Microsoft? First of all, we continue to have this mission to empower every person and every organization in the planet to achieve more. So that's why we decided let's sponsor the Adopt OpenJDK uh, project and ensure that there will be OpenJDK binaries available for every Java developer. So if you go to the Adopt OpenJDK, we are actually working with them to make that possible. A couple other things that happened and we continue to work on is Visual Studio Code. If you're an IntelliJ developer, Eclipse developer, NetBeans developer, that's fine. If you want a more lightweight text editor that is powerful, VS Code is a great option. And we have plenty of extensions that you can work on. In fact, Microsoft created several extensions for Java developers and has been working with companies like Red Hat and Pivotal to deliver those capabilities on VS Code. Over 17 million downloads already happened just over these extensions for the Java developers. So we, have re we are really excited about, about this. Um, one thing that we announced uh, recently, it was IntelliCode. Basically, it's an AI-powered capability for VS Code that you can, um, the, the system will learn from open source projects on GitHub using machine learning and provide you recommendations based on existing code. So it's not just rule-based recommendations, it's actually AI-powered recommendations. And we are going to bring Java support by November this year. Spring starters are also part of our strategy. We want to make sure that Spring developers, Spring Boot developers can quickly integrate with Azure services. That's why we continue to invest on those modules. Not only these modules are available already on store.spring.io, but also we continue to work on new ones that are already available on GitHub, just waiting to show up over here. So if you know Josh Long, just talk to him, get him to approve those modules to appear on the website. 
uh, we like we like Spring uh, the uh, Spring Initializer project, and we actually created uh, our version of Spring Initializer that you can from that website create a Spring project and push to GitHub right away instead of downloading a zip file. So it will create a repository for you and upload the source code to there. It's pretty neat and very simple. And we look forward to contribute this extension of Spring Initializer into the core project very soon. And we also have this extension for VS Code. Um, most important, of course, is being capable of connecting those at, to those Azure services. So that's why Open Service Broker API uh, is, is part of our plan. And we are making Azure services available through there, through that, so you can quickly through Cloud Foundry or any other platform to connect to those Azure services and enable those resources into your applications with easy consumption. And if you want to check out the source code, again, everything, everything is on GitHub. So where do Java applications run on Azure, some developers ask. Well, of course, as any cloud infrastructure, you have VMs. We also provide VM scale sets, so you can easily scale out your uh, infrastructure. We also provide serverless containers, so you can easily run a uh, Docker image or you have Kubernetes. Or, of course, you can put Pivotal Foundry on, on Azure and have a true uh, agile platform for your needs. On top of that, we also provide two services that are very easy to start. That is Azure Functions for serverless functions and Azure uh, App Service for web apps. So let's just take a look at those two uh, services, because I know you guys love uh, Cloud Foundry. You already know how it works. I just want to show you how we are integrating our services with the Java technologies. So you have uh, Azure Functions, which, by the way, became GA this week. And, uh, and we also uh, had an update on Spring Cloud Functions uh, to work with Azure Functions, the latest release. It was just announced yesterday. So uh, this is a simple code of Spring application, and you can run as a function. You can apply as a Maven plugin. It's very simple. What about a Java web application? Well, it's also a Spring Boot application. You code just like that. You can use Reactive if you want. And you can just enable the Azure plugin and do just Azure Web App Deploy. That's it. If you do prefer, that's fine. We can also do CF Push. So um, what, else, what else can we help with you know, making developers' life easier to go to production fast? to automate all the things. A couple weeks ago, uh, we announced Azure DevOps. It's a new set of services based on an existing service, but with some changes in how it's uh, uh, offered and how developers can use it. Uh, right now, you can simply go to GitHub in the settings of your project, go to the integration and marketplace, and search for Azure Pipelines. And that is part of Azure DevOps. And you can quickly build your applications for Windows, Mac, and Linux for free, up to 10 parallel jobs for open source projects. But if you, if you have a private project, we also provide several free hours to those, to those builds. We are almost done here. And I want to talk to you about Azure Dev Spaces. And if you feel like this is interesting, please stop by the Azure, uh, the Microsoft booth to learn more about it. Basically, Azure Dev Spaces allows you to create a, a Kubernetes cluster and iterate over the development of your application, including debugging your application on that Kubernetes cluster very easily running on Azure. And you can even share that Dev Space with other developers. Because as you know, developers are creating microservices. Your microservice might have to talk to other microservices. So you have this. Dev space, this cluster on Kubernetes for your development team to work on and to iterate over your development lifecycle. So it's a pretty cool feature, and the people at the booth can show you and live demo that right on. There's so much to learn about Microsoft and so much to learn about Azure that at Ignite in Orlando, that's happening this week, we announced Microsoft Learn. So if you want to learn about open source on Microsoft, if you want to learn about Azure services, or mobile development, you can go to Microsoft.com slash learn, create your profile, and start consuming documentation, articles, tutorials, workshops, everything online at your pace, because we know you want to learn as you wish. So this platform is really cool, and I hope you like it, because it's very engaging from a, a developer's standpoint in learning technologies. Lastly, perhaps an interesting announcement that we can do kind of, we are working and collaborating with the Zool systems to deliver 
Java LTS long-term support on Azure. So if you run Java from Azure on Azure, you get support for free. Whether it's a VM, whether it's a container, whether it's on app service or Azure Functions, we can give you uh, that support right on. You don't have to work with other vendors to, to have long-term support. As you saw yesterday, Java changed some of its, uh, uh, its ways of providing support, so we are making sure that customers and, and developers are safe on Azure. So with that, thank you so much. If you want to check those links and learn more, these are uh, some directions for you, and I hope you uh, have a good time. And if you have more, more questions, just stop by the booth to learn more. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.